Yo, what's up everybody? Professor V here and this is the lecture for Abnormal Psychology Chapter 5 Anxiety Disorders and Obsessive Compulsive Related Disorders. Let's go. Anxiety is a generalized state of apprehension or foreboding. Most people who say they have anxiety or use the word panic falls in the milder spectrum of anxiety reactions. During a true panic attack, the level of anxiety rises to the point of sheer terror and can immobilize a person. People who have experienced them describe them as the most frightening experiences of their lives. Anxiety is characterized by a range of symptoms, including physical behavior and cognitive features. Physical features include jumpiness, jitteriness, trembling, tightness in the pit of the stomach, heavy perspiration or sweating, sweaty palms, light hitting and, and lightheadedness, dryness in the mouth or throat, shortness of breath, heart pounding, cold fingers or limbs, nausea, and other physical symptoms. Behavioral features include avoidance, clinging or dependent behavior, and or agitated behavior. Cognitive features can include excessive worrying, nagging sense of dread about the future, preoccupation with bodily sensations, fear of losing control, thinking the same disturbing thoughts over and over and over, jumbled or confused thoughts, difficulty concentrating or focusing one's thoughts, and thinking things are getting out of hand. However, people with anxiety disorders don't necessarily experience all of these features. There are specific types of anxiety features that are defined by specific features in which we will discuss. So, going back to Rico and Shelly from chapter 4. If Rico was feeling dread for his future, has confused thinking, is physically jittery and agitated and worried about losing control, his symptoms would be suggestive of an anxiety disorder. This table provides an overview of the anxiety disorders in which we will cover that are defined by specific features stated on the last slide. Anxiety disorders are quite common when compared to other psychological disorders with one in five adults suffering from an anxiety disorder, which is about 40 million people in the US alone. Panic disorder is characterized by repeated panic attacks, which involve intense physical features, notably cardiovascular symptoms that may be accompanied by shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, heavy perspiration, weakness, or dizziness. In your textbooks on page 168, you can take a look at other key features on panic attacks in table 5.2. The essential feature of a panic disorder is occurrences of repeated, unexpected panic attacks. People who suffer from panic attacks often describe them as the worst experiences of their life and their coping ability are overwhelmed. They tend to be keenly aware of changes in their heart rate and often believe they may be suffering a heart attack even when nothing is wrong with their hearts. They feel nothing but terror, impending danger, and a strong urge to escape the environment causing the symptoms. Often panic attacks are sudden and last 10 to 15 minutes but could, but could potentially last for hours. Over time, they can become associated or triggered by certain situations or cues, such as walking into a crowded building or boarding an airplane. Panic attack sufferers often limit their outside activity in fear of recurrent attacks. This can lead to agoraphobia, the fear of venturing into public places. So for example, if Shelly was driving her car, singing along to the radio, and just feeling just generally happy, then all of a sudden she begins to sweat and her heart starts pounding and she feels nauseous. This is sudden onset of a panic attack and she'll experience all the feelings we just discussed. To be diagnosed of a panic disorder, several features of panic disorder must be present for a certain amount of time. However, all features of a panic disorder described in Table 5.2 in your textbooks or described in the DSM-5 do not have to be present. Not only that, but not all panic attacks are signs of a panic disorder. On average, 10% of people suffer from panic attack in a given year without suffering from panic disorder. To be diagnosed, the following criteria must be met. A person must have experienced repeated 
unexpected panic attacks and at least one of the attacks must have been followed by a period of at least one month that included either of both of these features. A, persistent fear of subsequent attacks or of the feared consequences of an attack, such as losing control, having a heart attack, or just going crazy. Or B, significant maladaptive change in behavior, such as limiting activities or refusing to leave the house or venture onto public or into the public for fear of having another panic attack. It is believed by most researchers and psychologists that panic disorder is panic attacks that result from both cognitive and biological factors. This results in misattributions and the physiological reactions. Often, when the physiological symptoms occur, as stated before, they are mistaken for other symptoms, such as symptoms of a heart attack. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for activating your body for action and during a panic attack, it tells the adrenal glands to, to secrete stress hormones into the bloodstream, epinephrine and norepinephrine. They are also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. These hormones intensify the physical sensations of the symptoms such as increased heart rate and breathing rate. When a person believes these are symptoms of an impending heart attack, this reinforces the bodily processes and perception of a threat and will worsen. This will lead to a full-fledged panic attack. However, there is natural help. GABA amino butric acid, or just GABA, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter which means it tones down excess activity in the central nervous system, which the sympathetic nervous system is a part of. GABA helps with, the decreasing, with decreasing the stress response. It is likely that those that suffer from panic attacks have lower levels of GABA activity in the brain. Again, people who suffer from panic disorder and panic attacks experience physiological symptoms such as racing hearts and shortness of breath. This may cause them to assess these symptoms as worse than they actually are, such as an impending heart attack or that they are dying right now. This could cause for anxiety to build and make the symptoms even worse. People that are high in anxiety sensitivity experience this worse than others. The two ways in which panic disorder are treated are drug therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, or just CBT. Usually antidepressants have anti-anxiety and anti-panic effects because they normalize neurotransmitter activity in the brain. Antidepressants are often prescribed to those that suffer from anxiety, panic disorders, and panic attacks, even if they are not depressed. However, there are side effects such as sleep problems, drowsiness, nausea, and dry mouth. CBT focuses on recognizing the onset of symptoms and coping with the symptoms just after onset. Just becoming aware of the anxiety or the onset of a panic attack is tremendously effective in combating anxiety and panic disorders. Psychologists also teach breathing techniques and relaxation exercises to reduce states of heightened bodily arousal. They teach those that suffer from anxiety and panic disorders when they recognize the symptoms not to think this is a heart attack, but to replace those thoughts with calm down, these feelings will pass quickly. Phobic disorder is an excessive irrational fear of specific objects or situations. Phobias involve a behavioral component, avoidance of the phobic stimulus, in addition to physical and cognitive features. Anxiety and phobia are closely related in such a way that anxiety and possibly panic attacks are experienced in response to a particular threat. There are many phobias, more than you could probably even think of. Everything from the fear of insects, anomophobia, to the fear of the sun, heliophobia, to the fear of walking, ambulophobia, and even the fear of sexual intercourse, genophobia. If someone has these such fears, they will experience the symptoms associated with anxiety and even panic disorder and panic attacks. The few phobias that I stated in the previous slide were specific phobias. These are phobias that pertain to objects or situations. When a person is put in one of these situations or the object is right in front of them, they will experience the symptoms of anxiety 
and panic disorder. The fear of spiders, arachnophobia, is a specific phobia. Now you may be thinking right now, huh? Yeah, that's me right there. I ain't messing with no spider, yo. I got them phobias. But if you don't feel the onset of anxiety, if your breathing doesn't get faster, your heart rate doesn't increase, or your pupils do not dilate and you, and you are not immobilized by fear, you do not have arachnophobia. If you are not in the fetal position in the corner of the room while the spider is in the opposite corner, chances are you do not have arachnophobia. If you had to kill a spider before and squished it with your chakla, you do not have arachnophobia. Does this make sense? You can apply this to all other specific phobias. Some other specific phobias are claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces, acrophobia, the fear of heights, ablutophobia, the fear of washing or bathing, seronophobia, the fear of lightning, mesophobia, the fear of germs or dirt, ophidophobia, the fear of snakes, nyctophobia, the fear of darkness, Pyrophobia, the fear of fire. Xenophobia, the fear of foreigners or strangers. And zoophobia, the fear of animals. Social phobia involves an intense fear of being judged negatively by others. It deals with fear that results in anxiety and even panic attacks to social situations such as dating, attending parties, or even social gatherings, or giving a presentation in class. Again, you may be thinking, Yo, that's me right there, yo. I hate giving presentations. Rethink it now though. Do you come down with trembling fear to the point you are profusely sweating, extreme high heart rate and breathing rate, and feel as if you're going to have a heart attack? Just because you are nervous about something or don't like something, doesn't mean you have a fear of it. Example. Shelly has a persistent fear that she is going to publicly embarrass or humiliate herself with some unintended behavioral mistake. She is overly critical of her own behavior, fears criticism by others, and experiences over arousal in interactions with others. She is best diagnosed as having a social phobia. Tell me what it's been like most recently. What, you know, what do you feel um, in your body? when you okay. start to experience a, a, some anxiety in a social situation? I'll give you some uh, examples, some scenarios where this okay. crops up. My wife and I like to go out uh, to dine, fine dining, I would call it fine dining. And unfortunately, the cost of dining um, does not seem to uh, admit of s sufficient separation between tables where you can have a romantic interlude. You're often seated next to someone, You're dining cheek to jowl at a fine restaurant. Mm -hmm. When I'm in a situation like that, I will clam up. It is almost impossible for me to communicate. I get paralyzed. Part Even of, with your wife? Absolutely. Um, and what happens is that I have this fear. I, I, I imagine that people are watching me. They're watching me stumble in my efforts to articulate. Mm -hmm. And typically, I'm very articulate. But in that setting, I can be almost rendered mute. Take me through what happens for you internally as you enter this party. There's a few people mingling there. Um, what happens for you? Your heartbeat. Yes, I was just. I was, yeah. I was just. I was just going to say. Um, I feel my heart racing. I feel there's a kind of hollowness inside my body, and hmm. it's almost like a, a feeling of, of a reverberation chamber. Like every every breath gets gets. You know, magnified. Um, um, I, I sweat. Mm. I stammer, which I don't always do, but in that setting, I can stammer. I start a conversation, and usually, for the first minute or two, I'm on target. Where I say something that's amusing, mm -hmm. and sometimes humor for me is a, is a way. It's my sort of social grease. But then there's a kind of halting pause after that because I basically um, my gas tank is now empty and I don't quite know what to do and I'm really worried that someone's going to ask me a question that's going to reveal how ignorant I am on that topic and the biggest fear is that I'm going to appear as ignorant and it's 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 so counter to who I am but it still is this distortion 
of thought. It's a cognitive distortion, call mm -hmm. it what you will, but it's a cognitive distortion that I am going to come across as stupid. So in that moment when your gas tank has become empty okay. and you're fearful of the next comment or question that will come your way, what do you do? Um, I might take a couple of deep breaths. I might excuse myself to go to the bathroom okay. and not return to that gathering. Okay. Because then the tank refills and I go to a different person that I've never had a conversation with and start off with some kind of uh, humorous remark. And then my tank goes to E almost immediately after. Agoraphobia is one of the most common phobias there is and can occur with or in the absence of panic disorder. It is the fear of open spaces or of being in crowded public places like markets. Also fear of leaving a safe place. It can occur in many places as I mentioned like in markets as well as what the slide states. Crowded stores, walking through crowded streets, on a bus, or just leaving your home since home is typically regarded as a safe place. It could even occur at school. Psychodynamic perspectives suggest that defense mechanisms are critical to the understanding of phobia. Ego mobilizes its defense mechanisms to fend off threatening impulses. In phobias, the Freudian defense mechanism of projection comes into play. Learning theorists offer a two-factor model to explain the developments of phobia, including both classical and operant conditioning. Fear component of phobias acquired through classical conditioning as previously neutral objects and situations gain the capacity to invoke fear by being paired with noxious or aversive stimuli. Avoidance component. Avoidance component of phobias acquired and maintained through operant conditioning, specifically negative reinforcement. Genetic factors may also play a role predisposing an individual to develop a phobia disorder not necessarily have a specific disorder. Genetic factors may also play a role predisposing an individual to develop a phobia disorder, not necessarily a specific phobia though. It has been shown that there is a link between variation of a particular gene and based on the sequencing of these genes results in different patterns of brain activity when people are exposed to something in which they fear. The end result may be a panic attack. Individuals with a particular form of the gene showed greater neuronal activity in response to fearful stimuli in the amygdala, an almond-shaped structure and the limbic system of the brain. To explain those with a phobia in the cognitive perspective, it could be due to a person being oversensitive to the stimuli in which they fear. People with phobias often perceive dangers and situations most people find safe, such as riding an elevator or overly sensitive to social cues, such as negative evaluations from others. Possible due to the overprediction of danger. Phobic individuals tend to overpredict how much fear or anxiety they will experience in a fearful situation, such as seeing a dentist. People who fear the dentist often have overestimation of how much pain they will experience when sitting in the dentist chair, or just self-defeating thoughts and irrational beliefs. When up against something that causes them fear, their first thought may be, I need to get out of here, or I'll sound stupid in front of all of these people. This further activates the sympathetic nervous system and intensifies the phobic disorder symptoms. In psychoanalysis, a therapist's focus will be on teaching the phobic person awareness of the inner conflicts that the person is having, freeing the ego from expending energy on repression. Modern psychotherapies also focus on awareness, however, from the source being on current relationships rather than past relationships and encourage clients to develop more adaptive behavior to overcome the anxiety and panic disorder. Other treatments focus on the perspectives we discussed in the previous slides. Systematic desensitization is one way a therapist focus on the learned fear, whether it be classically conditioned or operantly conditioned. So, for example, if Shelly wanted to see a therapist for anxiety, the therapist may teach Shelly how to relax under these stressful situations while working progressively through, in steps, 
from, from least fear causing to most fear causing called a fear stimulus hierarchy. Eventually, Shelly is able to remain calm in each of the situations presented in the hierarchy. This is systematic desensitization. Gradual exposure is different from systematic desensitization that it exposes the client to the actual stimuli and causes them fear directly, but for, but a little at a time. For instance, if the fear is the fear of crowded spaces, the therapist may one day put you in a room with two people, the next day, four people, the next day, six people, until you are no longer afraid of being in a crowded room and flooding exposes clients to high amounts of the stimulus right away and it is done many times the theory behind this is that if anxiety represents a conditioned response to a phobic stimulus and should dissipate if the individual remains in the phobic situation for a long enough period without harmful consequences the hopes is that the fear will become extinguished Cognitive therapists help with the identification and correct dysfunctional or distorted beliefs about the fearful stimuli. They help clients recognize logical flaws in thinking. Clients also may be asked to gather evidence to test beliefs. They may also use cognitive restructuring to aid a client. They will help them change their irrational dysfunctions, distorted beliefs into rational alternatives, such as if Rico believes that unbearable pain is forthcoming when he goes sees his doctor for the flu shot. The doctor may focus on his past experiences and aiding Rico to remember the last time in which he received the flu shot and that it wasn't painful or intense like at all. Again, antidepressants are used to treat anxiety and panic disorders and it has been shown that the combination of psychotherapy and drug therapy not only has a higher success rate, but a lower relapse rate. Anxiolytics is also another type of medication that treats anxiety, panic disorders, and the onset of panic attacks. Generalized anxiety disorder is where excessive anxiety and worries occur more days than not for at least six months. People with this disorder may also experience anxiety about a number of events or activities such as work or school performance. These feelings of anxiety have no particular source that can be pinpointed, nor can the person control the feelings even if in an effort is made to do so. People with this disorder are plain warriors. They worry excessively about money, their children, their lives, their friends, the dog, as well as things no one would see as to a reason to worry. They have muscle aches, experience sleeping problems, and are often irritable, which are all signs of stress. This GAD is often found occurring with other anxiety disorders and depression. From the psychodynamics perspective, generalized anxiety results from unacceptable sexual or aggressive urges leaking into conscious awareness. Other perspectives include a learning approach in which anxiety is learned and generalized across situations, a cognitive perspective for which anxiety results from maladaptive thinking patterns, and a biological perspective for which generalized anxiety is explained by irregularities in the amygdala and its connections to the frontal cortex. Treatment for generalized anxiety disorder typically includes antidepressant drugs or an anxiolytics and cognitive behavioral therapy. The first panic attack I had was in 2001 and uh, it, to me, was seemingly coming out of nowhere. I was working on a production job, and I mean, it was, there was no real pressure, and I was doing a budget, and all of a sudden, I just, I can only describe it physically, is from like the bottom of my body all the way up, I just got flushed with just this intense, you know, heat and feeling, and just heart palpitations, rushing heart, to the degree I thought I was going to pass out and have a heart attack. Or I literally, I thought I might be just going crazy. I really did. So I found um, some Doc in the Box 
Um, so he ran, runs the EKG, asks me a bunch of questions about my family history, and then he comes back and he goes, EKG is normal. I think you just have anxiety and you're having a panic attack. I'm like, I'm the last person in the world who would have a panic attack. He goes, well, actually, you, you're a great candidate because you try to manage everything and you can't. I think in general my personality is outgoing, upbeat, you know, happy-go-lucky. I have not always been a warrior, which is really why it was very surprising to me to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and panic attacks. After the initial panic attack in 01, I probably had about two more that I can really vividly remember. Um, they prescribed me Xanax on the spot when I had that initial one. And I took it a couple times, I hated it. Um, I was really kind of an anti-med type person. I was always like, well, if you get to the heart of whatever it is, then you can deal with it, you know, and don't mask it with meds and all that. I'd rather have a glass of wine, honestly. I was like, nah, screw that, I'll have a glass of wine and just chill out that way. And really that seemed to work for a while, you know? What happened was the anxiety, again, pushing it down and trying to present as everything is okay and I can handle everything, turned into insomnia. I mean, pretty chronic, you know, insomnia to the degree to where I was freaking falling apart. And I was trying every all natural thing under the sun to sleep. I mean, I have tried it all. I used to just think of sleep as a haven. Like that was my place, that was my place where I could just go and I love to sleep, I mean I love it. Since I was six and I started developing the insomnia, as I'm approaching bed, it's like I'm not gonna sleep tonight. And I'm already anxious, already. And borderline mad that I even have to think about that. I know if I get in bed before, after midnight, chances are my mind is already locked in a pattern of like, oh you're screwed, you're not gonna sleep tonight. And if I don't sleep that night, the next day, everybody can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. I mean, seriously, I feel that. I'm so angry. And it, it, the, it, the, my, the outlook on the world, my outlook on the world on a night that I don't sleep compared to the night that I sleep, night and day. Treatment for GAD follows similar treatment to panic disorders and anxiety by the use of antidepressants and CBT. Therapists focus on awareness of onset of symptoms and train clients on coping skills such as relaxation skills. Sometimes people get a thought running through their head that just won't go away. Like when a song gets stuck in one's mind. If that particular thought causes a lot of anxiety, it can become the basis for an obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. OCD is a disorder in which intruding thoughts that occur again and again and again are followed by some repetitive, ritualistic behavior or mental acts. Three major disorders in this category are covered. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, Body Dysmorphic Disorder, and Hoarding Disorder. Two other related disorders, Trichotillomania, which is hair pulling disorder, and Excoriation, Skin Picking Disorders, also fall under this category. Obsessive compulsive disorder involves recurrent patterns of obsessions, compulsions, or a combination of the two. Obsessions are nagging, persistent thoughts that create anxiety and seem beyond the person's ability to control. Compulsions are apparently irresistible, repetitive urges to perform certain behaviors such as repeated, elaborate washing after using the bathroom. An example of an obsession would be the fear of germs on one's hand, a cognitive process of thought. An example of a compulsion would be repeated hand washing to keep them germ free, an outward observable behavior. As you can see from the example and table 5.6, often the compulsions go with obsessions. Also, do not get habits confused with OCD. These are completely different behaviors. For one, habits are performed unconsciously, while OCD is conscious. The person is fully aware of the thoughts and the behaviors they are performing. 
a difference between a compulsion and a habit is that it is easy to interrupt and stop a habit if it is consciously noticed. Even if you know you are enacting a compulsion, it can be very difficult to stop the action even if it is destructive. A lot of people with obsessive compulsive disorder um, <laughs> have um, things that they do repetitively. Oh. Do you have any yes. of those repetitive symptoms? Yeah, one of the things that I do, and it, again, it's link, linked back to the responsibility issue. Um, yes. From my own front door on my house, I can lock it and walk away. On somebody else's front door, it takes me sometimes 20 times to lock it. Wow. So I've even broken keys in the lock trying to lock it. How so? Because I'll turn the lock, and the only way I can make sure that it's locked is to sort of feel the, the key almost the, the really hard to make sure that I can feel it in my hand. That's wow. how intense it is. Can you describe to me what's going through your head in those moments when you're continuing to turn the key and check and recheck? Fear. Fear of, you know, uh, them being broken into or injured or hurt or me, me getting in trouble. Okay. Is there any part of your brain at that moment that's saying, Dave, yes. walk away. Yes. It's locked. <laughs> yes. We're going to do the part that I tell myself, which is, and I know it's just, I mean, I understand that it's just me, but, you know, we're going to lock the door once today and leave. Yeah. It rarely happens. So sometimes <clears> you go back to check something and you find that there really is something that needed to be checked. Yeah, but nothing really of great. But nothing of great consequence. Time. So it's not like you've had a bad experience, like, oh, one time I did leave the door open and someone's house was broken into. No. It's just the thought that it could happen. So we go back to that idea of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Even, for example, I will make sure sometimes, I had a, I heard a story once of somebody that had left, uh, was filling a bucket of water mm -hmm. in the sink, kitchen, a house cleaner was filling a bucket of water. This, this may help you. Um, <clears throat> and he had the music turned up very loud and um, loudly and um, Forgot the bucket, forgot the water was running. The entire apartment was, I mean, it went down below into the next apartment. So then for a while, <laughs> I would go back and make sure all the water was turned off. That kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And I knew in my heart of hearts that the water was turned off, but I had to go back and check it anyways. So do you plan for that in your day, that it might take you 15 minutes to leave a house? Well, uh... No, I, I'll tell you another example where it comes up. Um, I will go. I will go in and, and plan the. Uh, maybe, yes and no. I mean, to answer to your question, now that I think about it, um, I'll assess a job to take, for example, three hours. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, it's really enjoyable for me. It's like meditation to come in and <laughs> do all this really detailed work. Mm -hmm. And I'll get fixed on a project, and I'll spend an extra hour without it even getting paid for it. Wow. And it, it's sort of a mixture because when I go in to a job and I have to, you know, pace so quickly, then it becomes unenjoyable. I don't care. I, it's just no fun. Behavior therapists have achieved impressive results in treating obsessive compulsive disorder with the technique of exposure with response prevention. Exposure component involves repeated and prolonged exposure to stimuli that provoke obsessions. Response prevention component involves preventing the compulsive behavior from occurring. SSRI antidepressant selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors also have therapeutic benefits in treating OCD. People diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder are preoccupied with an imagined or exaggerated physical defect in their appearance, such as skin blemishes, wrinkling of the face, body moles or spots, or even facial swelling. These preoccupations cause the individual to feel ugly or even disfigured. 
Body dysmorphic disorder is classified within the obsessive compulsive spectrum because people with this disorder often become obsessed with their perceived defect and feel compelled to check themselves in the mirror or engage in compulsive behaviors. Exposure therapy with response prevention is often used in treating body dysmorphic disorder. Hoarding disorder is a new disorder classified by the DSM-5, which is characterized by the accumulation and need to retain stacks of unnecessary and seemingly useless possessions. Hoarding disorder has an important emotional component characterized by the need to accumulate and retain possessions in an order to feel a sense of security. Hoarding disorder is different from OCD in that the obsessional thinking and hoarding disorder does not have the intrusive, unwanted thoughts found in OCD, and there is no urge to perform rituals to control the disturbing thoughts. People with hoarding disorder typically experience pleasure from collecting possessions and thinking about them, unlike the anxiety associated with obsessional thinking and OCD. Recent research suggests that people who hoard show abnormal patterns of activation in parts of the brain involved in such processes as decision-making and self-regulation. And this marks the end of chapter five lecture. Hope you enjoyed it and, and learned a thing or two about anxiety without panicking too much. I'll see y'all in the next lecture. Ciao.